Hi, I'm Christopher Schwarz, and before I started Lost Art Press in 2007, I was an editor at Popular Woodworking Magazine for almost 15 years. And during those years, I set up a lot of hand planes, a lot of vintage hand planes, and a lot of new, modern, premium hand planes. And before manufacturers such as Lee Nielsen and Veritas and Clifton made premium hand planes like this, I was in the same boat as everyone else, in that I had to fix up a lot of old Stanleys that I had picked up at flea markets. Now, I learned a lot in setting up these planes and the planes of hundreds of students that I have taught over the years, and recently I've gotten a lot of emails from them and questions about an article and a video that was in Fine Woodworking on how to set up a premium hand plane. Are all these techniques were, that were shown in the article and the video actually necessary? And my answer is, well, most of them are not. And so a lot of the things shown in those videos uh, were totally appropriate and good to do on old Stanleys that were pretty beat up or the castings had moved, but are actually completely unnecessary and can even be harmful to the plane if done to a premium hand tool plane that you paid good money for. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a brand new Lee Nielsen number four in iron uh, out of the box, never been opened, and show you how I go about setting up a premium hand tool plane the steps that I think are quite reasonable and can get us to work in just a few minutes. So let's dive in here right away. Now the first rule of setting up a premium hand plane is, my gosh, you paid hundreds of dollars for this thing, so if something is seriously wrong with it, send it back. There would probably rather fix it for you or replace it for you than try to deal with your diagno diagnosis, especially if you are um, a beginner. So here we have uh, number four in iron. It's never been uh, used um, from Lee Nielsen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to re release the lever cap first off and uh, loosen that up a little bit. They intentionally tighten this down, almost all plane manufacturers do, so that uh, it won't move while it's being shipped. Um, there's a little bit of oil on there, and so I'm just going to quickly wipe that off. Generally, I like to leave uh, oil on my uh, parts whenever I can so that uh, they won't rust, and I'm just going to wipe off a little bit here. But there's not really any cosmoline or any heavy machine oil on this, uh, so I don't really go to go to too many lengths uh, with that. Uh, some people will disassemble the frog and uh, clean out under there. I found that just completely unnecessary. I would rather leave the uh, lubricant that's in there in there, and if I have a problem with the tool, maybe I'll go poking down there, but uh, generally I'm not going to go looking for trouble um, because I almost never find it. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the chip breaker and the iron apart and uh, just look at it, make sure that it's okay, take off a little bit of the excess oil, and that's about all I'm going to do right now. So the next thing I can do is get my sharpening equipment and get this sharp. Now the great thing about modern tool manufacturers is that they spend a lot more time and attention on the iron, so you don't have to. Uh, here you can see on this Lee Nielsen uh, plane iron that they, uh, someone at the factory has done almost all the flattening that we need to do on uh, the, the back, or what some people call the face of the iron. I'm still going to touch it to the stones to try to uh, remove some of those scratches and make sure it's flat, but it's almost always uh, dead on flat, and if you deal with other manufacturers, such as Veritas, they even uh, use rotary lapping to make this a, a dead flat surface. So I'm not going to hit this on sandpaper or anything rough at all. I'm going to go right to my uh, 1000 grit water stone. Now I don't care what sort of sharpening system you use. Um, you know, water stones, uh, I like these because they don't have to be soaked. So I'm going to take uh, the, the back of the iron and put about three quarters of an inch, maybe five eighths of an inch on there, and I'm just going to rub it on this 1000 grit stone. This would be a soft Arkansas if this were an oil stone. And I'm going to give it a few rubs, and then I'm going to wipe it off, and I'm going to see 
if I've replaced the scratches from the factory with my own scratches. Now, there's still a few more factory scratches over here. This area is cleaning up nicely, so I'm going to just do it again. Now, you notice that I'm not uh, dragging the iron back, and I found that that generally helps by uh, my acuity is that I can see the scratches more easily if I just push in one direction. I'm sure somebody who knows more about lapping could tell me about it, uh, why that's true. Uh, so this is looking pretty good. Uh, there are a few vertical scratches, but they don't reach up here to the, to the edge. But just because I'm anal retentive, I'm going to uh, give it a, just a few more scratches, a few more swipes. Great. So I've replaced all of the scratches from the factory with scratches that I am very aware of what these scratches look like. Uh, I've replaced them all with my scratches at the edge. So that back is uh, all, that's as flat as we need to get it. All right, so we're going to now sharpen the bevel. We're going to uh, put a secondary bevel on the uh, primary factory bevel. I usually set a secondary at 35. So I have this uh, inexpensive side clamp honing guide, and I have this little stop block that tells me exactly where 35 degrees is. And then I tighten that, and then tighten it again. And now, a little more water. I can go to town. Now I'm going to put a slight camber on this blade by putting finger pre more finger pressure and more strokes at the corners than I do in the center. Okay, so I'm going to wipe off. I can see that I have sharpened all the way across the bevel and I'm going to feel to see if I've created a burr on that back side and if I have all the way across and the burrs even, I'm done. So I'm going to wipe the wheel. And if I wasn't sure of my uh, curve, I would check it with a little straight edge, but I, I uh, am pretty well attuned to the way these stones work and my jig. So I'm gonna just trust my experience. So then I'm just gonna go to my polishing stone. This is an 8,000 grit stone. And after I make sure that the wheel is wiped, I'm gonna do exactly the same operation on this. So now it's a visual game. I'm going to try to catch the light in, uh, in the secondary bevel and see if I've removed all the scratches from uh, the 1,000 grit stone with, these eight, with this 8,000 grit stone. Uh, it needs a little more work. All right. Oh, that totally did it. All right, so I'm gonna wipe off the wheel just so that it is clean the next time I use it, and then I'm gonna release it from the honing guide. The last thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to polish a little secondary bevel on the backside. I don't need to polish that whole tip. So I'm going to use this thin little ruler, and this is a trick made popular by David Charlesworth, and I'm going to slide onto the stone about 5 eighths of an inch and then slide back out. Slide back in and slide back out. So the first time you do this, it's gonna take a few times to get that tip completely polished. And then when you come back to rehone, you will find that that polishes up a lot faster because you've already done most of the work here. So that is now polished all the way across. I can see no deep scratches. So I'm going to take my thumbnail and I'm just going to feel that edge to see if it's completely smooth. You don't want to do this with the other side of your finger. So now I just need to put some oil on this because this is a water stone that we sharpened it on. And then we'll put the chip breaker on and we are almost ready to cut wood. Uh, one of the r other real nice things about uh, modern plane makers, uh, pretty much all of them, is that they have made uh, nice chip breakers instead of the whale hump chip breaker of the past uh, from Stanley. These are much more like uh, chip breakers you would find on an infill plane. And so uh, this chip breaker and some other chip breakers, uh, they have a little raised area here uh, that mates with the back of the iron. So you really do not have to do anything to it. And before I do anything to the chip breaker, I'm first going to confirm that I need to do anything with the chip breaker. So I'm going to move the chip breaker just absolutely as close as I can. Since this is for a smoothing plane, I'm gonna to try to get it just you know, five or six thousandths away 
from the tip, which will help control tearing. And I'm going to try to catch that bevel, that secondary bevel on the back, uh, catch it in the light, tap the chip breaker up real close like that, and then do the final tightening there. So the next thing to do is we need to sight through these gaps on either side to see if there's any light poking out from beneath the chip breaker. And if there is, then we need to remedy it. So uh, let's, let's take a look here. I can't see any light coming through this side. I can't see any light coming through this side. So that we're done. Okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, put the plane back together. Um, you know, I'm not going to do anything to the sole. I uh, generally don't check it with a straight edge. Uh, if there's something wrong with the plane, uh, the way that it uh, interacts with the wood will tell me that, and then I will go looking uh, for trouble. With a premium plane, generally you don't have to. I'm not going to file or sand the corners. They all feel nice and smooth. Um, if the, when the plane gets dinged, uh, I might sand or file those away. Um, everything looks fine. Uh, the way I like to get the iron into the plane is I hold uh, the frog surface so that it's parallel with the floor and then I navigate by dropping the iron onto the frog adjustment screw and then dropping it onto the frog adjustment dog on the frog. Lay in the lever cap, put our thumb on that and then snap that down. Now that was not a good enough snap. So I'm just going to tighten this up a little bit until it gets a little tighter. It, you want it tight enough that this won't move around in use, but loose enough that you can adjust it uh, while you are planing with the uh, uh, adjustment knob here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sight down the sole and extend the iron out until it appears as a black line all the way across the mouth. And then I'm going to adjust the iron laterally with the uh, lateral adjust knob here until that black line appears parallel all the way across the mouth. When it looks parallel, then I'm going to retract the iron until it just disappears. Then I'm going to remove some of the slack from the mechanism. I'm going to take a small 16th inch thick chip and I'm going to run it over the mouth and see where the iron is cutting. So it's cutting here in the middle and it's not cutting here right at the corner and it's cutting just a tiny bit there on the corner. So I'm just going to tap it a little bit here with an iron, with a hammer because I think that a hammer is more sensitive, which isn't always the case, but in this case a hammer is more sensitive. So now we've got a nice curve. Uh, the, the curve is in the middle, and so we are ready to plane some mahogany. So let's uh, first joint it flat with a jointer so that we know uh, what sort of surface we're dealing with, and then we can uh, see how the smoothing plane is doing. Um, Generally, uh, the stuff that comes off of the machine is going to be uh, pretty wonky, uh, at least as far as the joiner plane is concerned. So the first thing to do is to get rid of those machine marks and get it flat. And that way you'll be able to tell what your smoothing plane or your new plane or whatever it is, is really doing. So now I took full length shavings with my jointer. So now I can see what the smoothing plane is doing. Now, the first... The first few passes don't really count <laughs> because I'm just removing shavings from or stuff that is left over from the joiner plane. Now, you might be wondering why this is making such a different noise than the jointer. And that is because I have that chip breaker set up really close. And it does make a little different noise and it does compress the shavings a little bit, but this piece of mahogany, which has interlocked and row grain, is just completely clean of tear out. And the plane is behaving exactly as I would expect. So I don't think that there's anything uh, wrong with this plane, so there's no need to go looking for trouble, but I can now uh, get to work with this guy. Um, 
One last thing I would say is, um, you know, if you're getting tear out, you can close up the mouth of the tool uh, by adjusting the, uh, the frog adjustment screws back here, or in some cases, the whole frog has to be disassembled and moved forward. Uh, if you're not getting tear out and, you're not, and the plane's uh, not clogging, then don't mess with, um, don't mess with success. Oh,